Hello everyone, I am here with Dr. Michael Owens. He is running to represent Georgia's 13th Congressional District. He's been endorsed by brand new Congress, and he is the former chairman of Cobb County Democrats. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the program. Or should I say, Dr. Owens, thank you so much for coming on the program. <laughs> Michael's absolutely fine, and, uh, and I'm happy to be here today. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to get to come on, come on to your show and talk about uh, my district, my candidacy, and, and how we need to have change and how that's resonating you know, across the district, across the state, and ultimately across the country. Absolutely. And we can't begin the interview without sending a shout out to my viewer, Sam, who highly, highly recommended Dr. Owens, uh, who is going to be voting for you and is very enthusiastic about it. So I looked over your campaign um, uh, website. Your platform is incredible. Incredible. It's so robust. And this is really the case for a lot of people running for Congress. And also your resume is just stacked to the core. So tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to run for Congress. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, first and foremost, the reason I decided to run for Congress is, is really simple. We need people in Congress that's willing to represent the people. Um, and I mean that in the most earnest of ways. We, we know, we see where we've gone with corporations coming in, uh, where lobbying is just out of control. And, you know, corporate shareholder value continues to increase, increase while individual, you know, ownership in homes and stocks and uh, just basic day to day living is struggling. So, you know, my my reason for running is really, you know, you got the capacity and capability to go out there and make change. Uh, step up, you know, speak up and go do it. And and that's what you know, that's what my campaign is really about, you know, um, myself, my background. Uh, you mentioned that that I was uh, the former chairman of the Democratic Party in Cobb County. Um, and it's true, and I'm proud of that, right? We um, I took over an organization and that was that was relatively small and and built it through building a, a wide coalition um, of people and led on progressive values up front, unapologetic, um, and, and really to to gather people around the momentum that's been building. And we were able to do that. We were able to build the, the largest democratic committee uh, in the state of Georgia. And uh, it says a lot. Being in fact, that wasn't the best. That's literally the the, the heart of the. Uh, GOP in Georgia, you know, it's uh, it's the home of Johnny Isaacs, Senator Isaacson, and Newt Gingrich, and Tom Price, and you know, going going back before that. So the fact that we've been able to build something, uh, you know, through this big coalition, leading with progressive values, uh, is is what also let me know and give me kind of a firsthand idea of really what's going on on the ground. You know, I spent a lot of time working to help. Um, uh, in the sixth congressional district to get that district flipped. You remember back with the John Ossoff election, and then ultimately with Lucy McBath, uh, con now Congresswoman Lucy McBath, um, and and really just doing the work on the ground. I mean, working the grassroots, and you know, having the ability to be an elected member of the of the party, but at the same time having someone who's who's firmly you know continue to have a foot in the grassroots and in the community, and seeing how we could truly meld those together and understand you know this you know the the calling that people were really really clamoring for. So when you look at my platform, um, the platform is really about me. It's things that I care about. It's things that people in our district uh, that talk about, the, the things we talk about every single day. And, you know, we have to start it off with a conversation around around healthcare, right? And the fact that um, people are struggling throughout the district, throughout this country. And, you know, I just having a fundamental belief that healthcare is a right. And it's something that, you know, I say from the cradle to the grave and every single day in between, we have to make sure that that we have the basic dignity um, of having health care. But if you look at, you know, the rest of my platform, it really rounds out things that are really core and key to me uh, and, and things that are key. And, and really, people in our district really talk about a lot. You know, my I do have a background um, in in cybersecurity. I work cybersecurity now and, and national security. It's kind of it's my trade. I'm an, I'm an IT guy by trade. Um, that really kind of came up through the ranks and started working in cyber and started doing international uh, policy, mainly through data, data privacy and and cybersecurity policy. And so, you know, I know that in today's age, we're really missing that in Congress. Look, when I'm when I'm elected, I'll say when I'm elected to Congress, I'll, I'll be the first person in Congress that actually has a working background in cybersecurity. And I can't tell you how important that is now um, with the fact that we're facing threats internally, domestically, internationally, like we've never seen before. And it's important we have people that, that can talk about those things and at the same time be able to connect issues like national security to climate change, right? And then tie that to environmental justice and, and then tie environmental justice to, um, you know, criminal and social justice and how it's impacting people uh, on the ground every single day. And, you know, my district is, is fairly unique. It's, um, it's the, the west, southwest portion of Atlanta, metro Atlanta area, um, covers six counties. 
And uh, I know from, from, again, working on the ground, working in the community, uh, the challenge that they have, you know, and, you know, we're talking about districts where, um, you know, we have some of the highest rates of uninsured people in the country in some aspects, in the state of Georgia. And, um, you know, we, we have some pockets within our district where people are doing well. And we have pockets within our district where people aren't doing very well at all. I got some counties to where we just got uh, public transportation just this past year. And, you know, there's there's arguments and, and discussions between, you know, those that may lean left and lean right about, you know, the, the growth and how do we how do we grow? How do we expand within a district? Um, and then the last thing is is really around the fact that we have a congressman who is not meeting the needs of our district. And I don't know. You know how much more straightforward than I can say than that. Um, you know we're we're talking about a congressman who's been in office for uh, since 2002, and um, you know continues to do the the bidding of of, of corporate PACs and lobbyists, and um, has not, you know, been on the side of of where we need to be. You know, and, he, and someone who doesn't live in our district. So when you don't live in our district and and you're not supported by the people, but instead you're supported by the corporate PACs, then I'm not surprised when it comes time to vote that you're not voting in the best interest always of of our people. And um, and, you know, I, I don't want to, to to come on your show and, and disparage, you know, a sitting congressman. Um, but at the same time, we have to call out the reason when you ask me why I'm running. Uh, that is obviously part of why I'm running. If I felt that we were being served and the people of our district and Sam and others were actually being served, I wouldn't be running. You know, um, there's a I've, I've got a great career in cybersecurity and national security. I think I'm doing, um, you know, I, I'm providing service to our country, to our to our um, environment. So so I'm happy, very happy with what I'm doing. Um, but when I look at the work that our congressman is doing, I look at the fact how, you know, he isn't engaging. We haven't had a public town hall in over 10 years. Um, so so that kind of starts to tell you just a level of disconnect as I talk to you know, state representatives and county commissioners and mayors throughout our district, they don't have any type of relationship with our congressman. And I fundamentally think that's wrong. I think if we're truly, you know, going to enhance the work that some of our really good local elected officials are doing, we have to amplify that and build those connections between local government or national government so it can truly work for everybody. And that's not happening right now. And so, you know, that's, that's a large part of what I want to do is, is work as that, as that bridge. But at the same time, bring in these new, bold, big ideas that that and not be afraid to, to stand on those, you know, or not be encumbered because of corporate checks, right, that will not allow me to stand up and talk about how we need to work more on renewables, right, or how we need to um, stand up to big pharma and make sure that, you know, we, we're getting uh, drug costs under control. It's hard to do that when you're getting thousands and hundreds of thousands sometimes of dollars from these corporate entities. So, you know, I, I haven't accepted a single dime in, in corporate PAC money. I don't plan to. Um, you know, I know where my support is, and it's clearly on the ground. It's with the people. And uh, and that's the work we're going to do to continue to go out and, you know, and work to win this race. And you're so different because you really understand, and a lot of people who are running, um, endorsed by brand new Congress and otherwise, that when you run for Congress, you're serving the people. And apathy in and of itself from people who are sitting members of Congress, that is bad. But the problem isn't just that they're apathetic, seemingly. It's that they're moving in the wrong direction. And one portion of your platform that I really admire is um, you have an emphasis on foreign policy. And what I see with Democrats is they're shifting to the right. And I find that incredibly terrifying, to be frank, because I mean, it, with the Iraq war, we saw some opposition from Democrats for the most part, but increasingly, they've become more militaristic. And you say pretty bluntly, you know, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to immediately stop funding Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, which is murdering yes. children. So can you talk a little bit about foreign policy and what someone like you would be able to do to kind of shift the Overton window back to the left, at least with regard to the Democratic Party? Yeah, I, I think that's very important. And the fact that that I have it as one of my one of my key elements in my platform shows you just how committed I am to that. But I also wanted to put it there as a, as a spotlight, right, to talk about some of the atrocities that's going on. And, you know, we are we're now 18 years into this war in Afghanistan. Um, you know, there are going to be voters going to be going to the poll in November who we've been at war their entire life. I'm a third generation uh, Marine Corps veteran, and I, I couldn't be any more proud of it. Uh, I'm happy of the service. I still continue to serve in, in many ways. And I think I do think it's important that veterans uh, that are on the left, veterans are Democrats, to speak up. Right. Those of us particularly that work 
in counterterrorism, international affairs that work in cybersecurity. It's important that we stand up and have a platform to be able to talk on. So, you know, I was I was fortunate enough to go to the Army War College uh, last year and went through their national security seminar. And, you know, I was able to work with with lieutenant colonels and colonels from across the country. And we were able to talk about these national security issues, right, and our national policies. And, you know, being someone that's that's a, a, a firmly from the left, to be able to talk about those issues, you know, but but still remain firm that I'm a Democrat. And but I, I can you know, we we've had a long time where I think those from the right has led those conversations when it comes to foreign affairs and national security, uh, even to the point to where you have Democrats that 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 somehow wind up echoing those same Republican talking points. And we absolutely have to stop that. You know, um, I, I make it very clear with people, you know, my military service was a cornerstone of, of who part of what made me who I am. Um, but I but I always believe in leading with diplomacy. So, you know, my, my foreign policy positions is um, is, yes, we should have um, a, a strong military. We should have a very capable military. Uh, I still think the military does a great job at developing technology and, and, and having great platforms um, in which people can learn trades and, and all the rest. But when it comes to the idea of committing our troops uh, overseas to to potentially die, um, we've got to raise the bar on what that means. You know, um, so I, I think about that a lot. So when I talk about, you know, us making sure that we lead with diplomacy as our first stance on foreign engagement, that's what we have to do. Secondly, um, and which may be even more importantly, is that we have to understand who our allies are and who our adversaries are and then treat them as such. And I think we've lost it somewhere along the way. Um, I know from from the White House, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem right now. Um, but you, you see that going downstream from there. We have to be very clear um, about our, our trade and, and how we how that impacts different elements in the world. One of the largest things I think that I see and when I talk to people in the district when, when foreign affairs or national security comes up, a lot of times discussions around interventionism. It's what it really boils down to, right? When, where, how, and why do we get involved in, in different conflicts, skirmishes, flat out wars in different parts of the world? And what we've seen for years now is that um, it's not always on a consistent basis. Right. Um, you know, we, we engage in certain parts of the world where where there may be humanitarian issues in other parts of the world where there's flat out genocide going on. We do absolutely nothing. Um, and the vast majority of the time, it usually ends up ends up being, is there a natural resource there that we want or what's the color of someone's skin? And, and we absolutely have to get away from that. So when I talk about, you know, immediately ending that funding about the Saudis in the Yemen war, we had an opportunity to do that. We had an opportunity and we had five Democrats that decided to vote the Republicans to keep that going on. And unfortunately, my opponent, Congressman David Scott, was one of those five. So again, it's one of those one of those situations where I've got to step up and do something. And I've got to call it out and I've got to make it kind of a, a key component to to my platform when I'm talking about national security specifically. And it's great because people like you are shifting the Overton window, which is so necessary. And what really stood out to me was when Ilhan Omar recently denounced U.S. imperialism, like the response that she got, people were so shocked and they were taken aback, like, oh, wow, a sitting member of Congress actually said this. And to be at a point where that's shocking shows how much work we have to put in. So it's just step by sure. step, you know, elected member uh, by elected member, one at a time, getting them in power and making sure that we really change the way that we think about wars, you know, there's no humanitarian wars and U.S. interventionism. It's not about helping people. It's about, you know, boosting profits. You know, it's a capitalist yeah. machine. So I I'm really glad that you're running and you're kind of putting that front and center. And every kind of candidate so far, and I'm not saying that this is kind of your main issue that I've talked to, they kind of have like one thing and they make it the, the cornerstone of their campaign based on their life experiences. So if you kind of had like one issue that is your top issue, even though there's a number of things that I know you support, what would you say is kind of like your priority just personally? Yeah, you know, that's um, that, that's really hard to answer because if you put it in the context of my personal life experience and uh, and relate that to my, my platform, you know, it, it really does have to be centered around um, you know, foreign policy and cybersecurity specifically, because that's the area I work in. And, you know, and understanding kind of where we are now, we have, you know, we have domestic threats. We obviously have China and Iran and Russia. And, you know, we, we're facing threats today like we've never seen before. I throw out a statistic a lot of time um, around kind of what's going on and that if you add up from a pure monetary transactional perspective, um, more money is stolen um, through cyber theft 
every year than it is through every drug transaction that happens in this country. You know, um, so when you think about it in that context, um, cyber crime is everywhere, right? It's rampant nowadays, um, but people don't react to it the same way because my next question is usually, how many people do you know that's been arrested or indicted or gone to jail for a cyber crime? Almost no one's hands goes up. But you turn around and go, who do you know that's been indicted, arrested, and gone to jail for a drug charge? Almost everyone's hands go up. So, so even with that, you can see it's not not a monetary thing. It's not a criminal activity driven thing. Um, you know, so I tie the cyber crime back to you know, coupling that with you know the the ability that we have to go into a scenario where we have to stop locking everyone up, right? We have to end this field war on drugs. Um, and we have to understand that that is not the largest threat that we face today. For 25 years, people have been saying that we've got to we've got to do something about this drug problem. We've got to lock these criminals up. We throw away the keys. We have built supermax prisons where we lock people up um, more than anywhere else in the face of the world. And even within my district, I have a county in my district uh, that if you just took that county per capita, it would be one of the top five places in the world that people get locked up. Not the country, but the world. And, you know, so things like that happen. We know there's, you know, we, we know there's 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 an issue around racism that comes with that. We know there's profiling that happens with that. We know there's um, disproportionate uh, sentencing that occurs that, that's going on occurring. And, you know, so it's another reason why I started off by saying, you know what, we've got to deschedule de- 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 marijuana. Um, you know, we've got to stop locking up, you know, kids and throwing away the key that's putting more pressure on on mothers and grandmothers and tias and abuelas that are out there. Right. So we have to make sure that, you know, we're stopping those things. And I call for, a, you know, to even go into ensuring that we are stopping cash bail. Right. We no longer use that because, you know, when it really boils down to it, cash bail is as simple as this. It is, you know, the amount of money you have in the bank determines how long you stay in jail. And that's fundamentally wrong. Right. So, you know, what I look to do is I look to weave and tie these things together. Um, so my platform, when I look at it, it's not you know, single pillars, when I really look at it, is, is things that we've truly weave together to to make this, you know, the, the fabric of our country a better place. And that's that's really how I formulated my platform. I really sat down and I said, Michael, what are the things that are most important to you? What are the things that you could change? What are, you know, in, in a, it's like, what heels are you willing to go die on? You know, um, how, what are those things that are truly, truly passionate to you? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's really where it came from. So, you know, if it was really personal to me, it's just where I feel I can help. Um, you know, it would have to be starting with getting people to understand the actual threats that we have that are facing us today in cybersecurity and understanding that it's not just, you know, um, some kid in their grandmother's basement, right, trying to hack into their school. We're talking about we now have nation states um, that are funding full blown cyber operations that are looking at, you know, attacking our electrical grid, our water treatment facilities, um, you know, that are that are starting to become invasive in in the healthcare field where ransomware now is taken off to where they're they're literally locking, you know, health practitioners out of all their med- uh, all their medical records. So now you have people in hospital beds that, you know, you got between two and four hours and people may start dying because of a cyber hack. You know, you have things like uh, pacemakers and, and insulin pumps, because on one hand, it's great that we're putting you know, we're, we're having IP addresses and we're, we're basically putting everything online from microwaves to TVs, but we're also putting those pacemakers and we're also putting those insulin pumps um, on Wi-Fi. So once you do that, it becomes hackable, you know. Um, so, you know, think about think about the fact you combine ransomware with, you know, Wi-Fi enabled pacemakers. That's that's a pretty scary thought. Right. You mm-hmm. get an email and they go, hey, I just hacked your pacemaker, you know send me, you know, X amount of dollars or I'm going to shut it off. Um, so, you know, I try not to have too many doom and gloom around it. But what I try to do is emphasize the fact of where we really are today in today's society and the threats that we're facing and the fact that Congress isn't prepared for it. We have members of Congress who, you know, who are still using flip phones. They, you know, they, uh, they, they don't understand the challenges that, that are there today. So, you know, if it was if it was really me talking about, you know, somewhere where I could immediately have impact and where I could take on some of the challenge today and really, really help. We've all seen, you know, those segments where, you know, someone comes in to, to Congress for a hearing. And you have Congress people that are trying to ask questions about the Internet and about, you know, the cloud and about, 
you know, cybersecurity, and they just can't get the questions right because they fundamentally don't understand the technology or the threats that are facing us. So, you know, that's one area where obviously because of my background, you know, I, look, I was I was in Ukraine a year and a half ago, I think, uh, um, working with the Ukrainian government, working uh, with people from the State Department, talking about the challenges and issues that Ukraine was facing then when Russia was shutting down their electrical grid. And, um, you know, so I also I got to meet uh, our, our ambassador uh, to Ukraine at the time. And um, it was a great opportunity to go over there, but to truly understand how much of a global epidemic it is and then to see threats that come out of Eastern Europe um, and how they make their way across the country. Right. So those are automatically things we have to talk about. And then I dovetail that straight into election security, election integrity. Right. And how, you know, it's, it's part of our democracy. And uh, and we're still not prepared for it. You know, um, we still need federal level oversight, I think. And I would propose when it comes to election security as a whole is that, you know, federal government really got to get together, lay out some guidelines, lay out some mandates about how our elections should be handled. And it's not simply about election machines. We get a lot of talk about, you know, hackable election machines and going to paper ballots, which is great from a from a from a stopgap perspective. But I really look at the entire election ecosystem, right, from the because going back to paper ballots, if anyone goes back and wants to remember back to 2000s, you know, you'll find paper ballots in in the back of semi trucks two two months after the elections occur. Right. So um, we know that can't be the solution. We've got to continue to push past that. And so that means we've really got to take election security really seriously. I think we can get there. But I also want to push forward. You know, part of things I would like to see is. You know, as 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 those of us that are left, they're talking about disenfranchisement or talking about voter suppression uh, tactics. I really want to push the other way, and I want to go. I want to make you know election. I want to make voting more more accessible to everyone, and not just through more polling locations, you know, or more or more weeks that you have early voting. I literally want to get to where every single person is able to vote from their phone, right? So we can get we can get voting voting participation rates up to. You know, 80, 90 percent, 95 percent, because when it's there and we can actually do that, um, that's the that's the opportunities we're going to have. And we know already is that when more people have an opportunity to go out and vote, you're bringing you bring in more people into the electorate. Right. More people are having their say. So what's most more important to democracy than having more people actually able to vote? I think we can get there. I know we have the technology in place. There's security parameters that need to be put in place. but We can do that. Um, so I want to challenge us. I want to challenge our Congress. I want to challenge this country to truly become more democratic by making sure we're getting more people involved and we're utilizing the technology we can do. Look, we're doing it today with, you know, nanosecond transactions on Wall Street. You know, we're doing it with everybody that uses um, a credit card or, or, or debit card every single day. Um, you know, so we have the capability to do it. We just need people again that's going to be pretty courageous about it and willing to step up and, and make those changes. And who know what they're talking about, because when you um, brought up the example of members of Congress questioning, you know, um, tech CEOs, it's just it's so hilariously sad that they don't know what they're talking about. And when I hear all this conversation about like election interference in the mainstream media, how is the conversation not about increasing cybersecurity? Like it doesn't make any sense to me. Exactly. So there needs yes. to be people like you who understand, you know, technology and are really aware of these things. And I think that really you know, widening the scope of this conversation, because I hadn't considered the thought of, you know, interfering with someone's pacemaker and hacking that that's that's horrifying. You know, my dad has a pacemaker. So that is a horrifying thought. So absolutely, we should be talking about that. So you are bringing something so fresh, so unique to the table. And I know the people who are watching are going to be on board with you. So tell us what we can do to help you get elected. If we're in your state, what can we do to volunteer? If we're out of state, how can we help you? Yeah, you know, so, um, so, you know, the first thing is just raising awareness, right? I mean, you know, you, you and I talked about the fact that, you know, I've been endorsed by brand new Congress. I'm, I'm super, I'm still really excited about that um, because what we're able to do is, you know, it, it is it is a measure where, you know, especially for those of us that are fighting, uh, you know, entrenched incumbents uh, to raise that awareness about what's going on and let people know that there are people with fresh ideas, with bold ideas that are in this race that are passionate to make a difference. So first and foremost is raising that awareness. Get online, you know, uh, go to my website, www.owensforcongress.com. Uh, go to my Twitter, you know, uh, Twitter handle at um, Owens4GA13. 
And, and first of all, just amplify it. Just put it out there. I mentioned the fact that we're not taking any uh, corporate PAC money. I think that's just absolutely wrong. I've told people time and time again, I can't talk about being a change agent if I'm willing to do the same things that that's propping my my uh, opponent, the incumbent up right now. So fundamentally, we have to do things different. I mentioned before, I know where our strength is. Our strength is out there with the people. Um, and that's ultimately how we're going to win this race. So, you know, donations of $5, you know, $20, $100, uh, whatever that is helps. I know, you know, at through running this race and looking at, uh, at, at where the money is coming from, where donors are coming from, it's unfortunate. We'd love all love to get this money out of politics. I'd love nothing more, you know, than, than to have a public public option when it comes to um, campaigning. I think that would level the playing field a lot, uh, you know, in a race such as mine where, you know, the incumbent literally had 11 individual donors. You know, at, at the time, I think I had over 500, 600 individual, individual donors. At the time, he had 11 individual donors and not a single one of those donors from was within the district. Think about that. He's been in he's been in Congress since 2002 and he has not had a single person donate, not a single human from within this district donate. That is problematic. It's, it's, it's a it's, it, it speaks loudly and clearly about where we are. If someone like me can be considered an underdog who's been twice elected as a county party chairman, who's worked on the ground to help, you know, flip seats in, in red districts, you know, someone who's worked to flip seats at at, um, at state house, state senate, city council. But I'm considered an underdog by someone who doesn't live in their district and don't receive a single dime of funding from within their district. Something is inherently wrong with that system. So what I would do is I would ask everyone that's watching, everyone that's out there, um, you know, help be a part of this change. Help be a part of Team Owens and, you know, go out there and make a donation. Uh, follow us on, on Twitter, Instagram, you know, share a post. Uh, donate what you can. Become a reoccurring donor. You know, a little bit every single month helps. And then uh, for those of you all that are in the district, sure, drop us, drop us a few coins. But, you know, then get out there with, with us on the weekends. You know, tell your families, your friends, your neighbors, you know, people to go to church with about the campaign. Um, I'm accessible. You know, people call me on my cell phone all the time. Uh, speak with a member of the team. Go to our website and sign up to volunteer. You know, we've got a lot of things going on. We're going to be knocking on on thousands and thousands of doors between now and May 19th. So we're going to, you know, we're going to need that energy on the ground. I know what it's like. I've worked to flip seats before. Um, I know how to do it. I know what it takes to to make it happen. And I know that we can win this race. This is not, you know, this race is not a protest against the party. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a member of the party and I'm proud of it. I just I have a different view, you know, and, and those core tenets around around health care, believing, you know, proudly standing up for Medicare for all and, and, and having no doubt that's the way and knowing that we have to do um, standing up for a minute for a living wage and making sure that we absolutely have to have it. I can stand on these things, you know, where as my opponent is, is mainly known for having a, a health fair once a year. It's a one time event. And I say, you know, a health fair is great, but we don't need health fair. We need health care. You know, public option is not the answer. We need Medicare for all. Um, he's also known for having, uh, again, an annual job fair where once a year you, you bring in a lot of people and, um, you know, you host a job fair. You have people bringing in resumes. And, and that to me is even that in itself is kind of archaic because, you know, we have this thing today called the Internet. You can just email in a resume. You don't have to take off your work or you don't have to get on a bus or drive down to another part of the district um, to turn in a resume to someone who doesn't even have any job openings available. You know, so I don't want to I don't want to get inundated with having health. I mean, health fairs or job fairs. You know, I want to make sure that every single person in my district has health care. And I want to make sure that we're bringing actual jobs into the district, not that we're having a health fair, you know, around jobs that don't even exist. I want to make sure we're bringing in high paying, good quality jobs. And also make sure that we're, we're raising the bar on educational opportunities within our district. Um, you know, we want to make sure that I, you know, I'm a proud graduate of uh, of an HBCU. I also went to Georgia Tech, which is which is right here in the area. And I want to make sure that you know schools like that have an opportunity uh, to reach students in my district. And I think it would it, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the fact of um, where we are with with student loans and and the debt crisis that's going on around that, um, and the fact that. You know, we, we've got to have a way out of that. I want to see more students be able to stay in our district and go to a quality college um, and not be saddled in debt when they come out. And, uh, you know, and make sure that, you know, these these credit card companies stay away from our students, you know, in college to make sure that, um, 
you know, we're not saddled in debt forever because it becomes an intergenerational thing. You know, when you're saddled with debt coming out of college, um, you know, when, when about five years out when you should be buying your house, instead you're dealing with a ballooning, you know, interest rate and ballooning payments that comes with that, uh, with those student loans. So instead of buying that house, you know, five years out of school, sometimes it's 10, it's 15 years, you know, and you still have student debt. But, you know, what happens is that that 10 years that goes by where you could be building solid equity within your home, which we know is one of the largest determinants of, of asset management, asset wealth, right? We aren't doing that, you know, and that's directly hurting our districts primarily in minority majority districts like ours where you know the vast majority of people are still renting we've got to find a way for people to have home ownership this has gone back you know all the way back to the 60s with redlining and everything else um and and we've got to break down those barriers right and people ask me like hey you know what's the difference between being a being just a democrat and being a progressive and you know i sell i i view myself as both and i don't i don't see um contradiction between the two but i do see a difference because, you know, as Democrats for a long time, we've said, you know, give us affirmative action, give us quotas, give us give us the ability that if we work really hard, you know, and as and as, as black people or, or as Latinos, if we work twice as hard, if we save twice as much, if, if, if we do those things to stay out of trouble, we will have a shot. And, you know, I'm here to say that's not where we are anymore. We, we've, we've passed that. You know, we have to work as, as progressives to say we, we have to tear down these institutional barriers that stand in our way. Right. Home ownership is one of those, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, we tear down these uh, these these institute or instruction inst instrumental um, biases that are there within the court system, that are there within a the judicial system. Um, you know, these biases are going, we've got to tear those down. So we're no longer asking for quotas. We're no longer asking for to just give us a shot. We're saying tear down those boundaries, level the playing field. We got to talk about equality and equity, so we can all start off on the same foot, um, and then we move forward. And that's where we have to push to. So when we talk about bold ideas. You know, we're not going to fault anybody for having a silver spoon in their mouth. Um, we realize that that's the case, but but give us a fair shot as we go through. And that silver spoon shouldn't determine you know my outlook on life. So um, you know that's really the big thing at, at where I look at it is. We've got to start tearing. We have to tear down those boundaries. We have to invest in our schools. We have to invest in our teachers. You know, I fully support making sure that our teachers, you know, um, not only earn a, a decent wage, um, but we actually restore the dignity that our teachers, you know, the, 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 the professors, right, that those folks that are literally training our next generation. Um, we've got to restore their place in society. And, um, you know, far too often we've got to go back to the trades, you know, um, to apprenticeships supporting our unions and making sure that, um, you know, just because someone doesn't go to a four-year university, they're not seen as a failure, right? We're making sure that we have opportunities uh, for those kids who either never went off, off to a, to a four-year school or that for whatever reason didn't finish. But we've got to make sure that there's room for them as well. Um, you know, it falls right into our jobs or economic, our economic platform, total economic reform around that. So there's so many things to get into um, because I think we've just marginalized our working class so much. Um, and we see this disparity growing more and more and more, you know, back back to the you know the quintessential cliche of the haves and the have nots. Um, and we fundamentally have to do something about that. So, you know, I, I can tell you at, at a core level, that's what my campaign is about. So many members that are that are on the 2020 slate with me with uh, with brand new Congress from Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez, you know, um, to, you know, Albert Lee out in out in Oregon. You know, there's so many of us across the country. Um, that is, that are really, you know, fundamentally have this belief that we've got to do this. You know, we've got to stop this this school to prison pipeline. You know, there's so many things that we know we have to work on. You know, and and that's really what it's about. And that's why I'm proud to be running. I, I'm proud to have tons of support on the ground already. I'm, you know, we're we're picking up, you know, donations and and people that are willing to help from all over the country. And that that's huge to us because we know that's what we need because this race you know, is undoubtedly about the constituents within the 13th congressional district. It's where I live. It's where my children go to school. Um, but I also realize it's larger than just the 13th district. You know, it's also about trying to turn this state blue, which we've, we've worked very hard, you know, and, and I, I, I'm still, you know, making that fight with Stacey Abrams, right, to continue to move forward and make sure that we tear down those boundaries. So, you know, it's about turning this state blue. And then ultimately, it's, it's about winning these Senate seats that we have, a U.S. Senate that's coming up in 2020 as well. And then ultimately, it's about turning, turning uh, 
you know, um, flipping the White House and making sure that we put a Democrat in the White House. So, you know, it, it goes up and down the ballot the whole way. And I think when you have people like me that are running, that's already worked on the ground to kind of flip seats, you know, I know what I'm going to do when I get elected. You know, I, I know how many more people I'm going to help get elected, you know, from city council to state rep and on, on up. Um, that is what we have to have. We have to have progressives that get elected um, that is willing to, to reach that handout and help the next person up. That's willing to, um, you know, go out there on the stump and and go help, you know, a fellow Democrat to go get elected. That that's running a solid, sound um, platform. That's not happening right now, you know. And when you don't do that, you don't build that bench, you know. And you don't you don't set yourself up for success, you know. If you look through our party, it's unfortunate, you know. But but we do see a, a huge gap that's there between our our House leadership and even our Senate leadership. And then to to those people who are actually running for office, and you know that gap just shouldn't be there. And it's not a it's not an ageism thing. That's not at all where we're going with that. But it has to be about staying relevant. It has about it has to be about um, staying in tune. It has to be about staying relevant and present with what's going on. And you know, speaking of firsthand knowledge, I can tell you that's not happening within the 13th district of, of Georgia. And our constituents are suffering for it, right? They're they're not getting the representation representation that they need. So unfortunately, those services that are just there, we're getting again, we're getting one day year events, right? We're getting job fairs and health fairs instead of actual health care and actual jobs coming into our district. So that's what I'm running on. You know, I hope that you know through this and many other efforts to kind of get my campaign, my platform, and and kind of my passion about why I'm running to get it out there. Um, so ultimately, we can win this race. We, we we really have to. And I feel like when you talk about the 13th district and what, you know, um, David Scott has been doing, it seems like people in Georgia's 13th don't have a representative. Like, that's not representation, you know, once a year events and whatnot. So if you live in that district, there's no question. You know, Dr. Michael Owens is the answer. One more time before we go, tell us the website. It's www.owensforcongress.com, O-W-E-N-S-F-O-R, congress.com. And we'll have that up on the screen as well. Dr. Michael Owens, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. We'll be following your campaign, and we are rooting for you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. I'm happy to be on.